Welcome to the January 2021 BJ360 podcast. My name is Sarah Gill and I join you this month from the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow. I'm delighted that you're joining us in this journal club discussion of the BJ360 December edition. So the plan is to kick off this month's podcast with a brief summary of the excellent feature article from the team in Norwich looking at the investigation of the painful joint arthroplasty, which is well worth a read. I'm really pleased to introduce my guest this month, Mr. Andy Marsh. And we're going to summarise uh, our highlights from the journal with a few selected papers uh, before discussing a couple of papers in particular focus, looking at some work we hope and think you'll find interesting to round off our orthopaedic literature update. So the feature in uh, the December edition um, was the investigation of painful joint arthroplasty. And this is a great piece from Norwich and we're very grateful to them for their input. I think one of the main strengths of the feature is that it really emphasizes the MDT approach that's required when addressing the painful joint arthroplasty. The feature very neatly splits causes of pain into intrinsic and extrinsic causes, intrinsic being implant infection, instability, aseptic loosening, or various soft tissue impingement issues, and extrinsic being those such as adjacent joint disease, spinal pathology, vascular disease, malignancy, or metabolic bone disease. I think the feature, when you read it through, it provides a really good roadmap um, and discusses sequentially the evidence for clinical, radiological, microbiological and biochemical workup of these clinical problems. It's a really thorough update uh, on this common clinical problem. And I think it would be of interest to primary and revision arthroplasty surgeons and also trainees of all grades who will be exposed and involved in the presentation and workup of these patients. So do give it a read and get in touch with us and let us know your thoughts. Now, the original plan for this month was a trauma update from the OTS, but as feels increasingly common at the moment, plans have had to be flexible. And I look forward to catching up with the OTS guys later in the year at the rescheduled meeting. But it does give us opportunity to have someone with us this month that I've been looking forward to having on as a guest. So it's actually all worked out pretty well. Andy Marsh is one of my pelvic and acetabular colleagues here at the Queen Elizabeth, um, although I somehow feel like that comparison is slightly flattering to me. Andy is fellowship trained in revision hips with Dominant Meek, lower limb trauma at the Royal Melbourne with Andrew Oppie and p trauma with Pete Bates and Paul Colpan at the Royal London. So his depth and breadth of practice and clarity of thought means we're very lucky to have him here in the unit. And I'm really pleased he's offering up his thoughts to our listenership today. So Andy, thank you very much for being strong armed into uh, doing this. Thank you very much, Sarah. It's great to be invited. Yeah, so the first paper that I've picked out um, is one from the trauma section. Uh, And this is a paper from Vancouver. And I don't think that it can be considered the definitive word on the subject, but I do think it's a really interesting paper and that it's useful to everyday practice. And I've always got a bit of a, of a soft spot for ones that, that you sort of, you think actually that helps me on a daily basis. Um, so this paper uh, published in the JOT looks at the use of adjuvant plates um, in both open and closed proximal tibial fractures. And adjuvant plates is one of those tools that we talk about having in the toolbox um, for preventing that flexion and coronal angulation um, when we're using uh, intramedullary fixation for these proximal metaphyseal fractures. The study looks at a small cohort by modern standards uh, and they identify 53 patients from this year with a proximal tibial fracture. Uh, So one of the variables that looks at was type of fixation use. So about half of these, 29, had an intramedullary nail only. Um, 24, therefore, had a nail and plate combo. And of those 24, 13 of those plates were retained um, at that primary fixation, and 11 had them removed um, before closure. And another variable they looked at was open or closed injuries, with 20 being open and 33 being closed. The authors note um, that more open fractures were treated with a nail plate combo than nails alone. 88% of the open fractures got a nail uh, plate combo. So you've sort of got this double crossover study here, open versus closed, nail versus nail and plate, retain plate versus take it out. And the main messages as I see them is um, one, in closed injuries, um, a quarter had an open reduction in plate fixation and the union rate was 100%. So in these closed injuries, there seems to be no penalty for using this plate if you feel it's required. Uh, The second is that there was no difference um, or no evidence of difference between retained or removing the plates. That didn't seem to affect infection or non-union. 
Uh, and overall, in the seven non-unions in that 53 cohort, one had a retained plate, one had a removed plate, and five, five um, had nails only. Um, so whilst the conclusions I'm drawing for this are a little bit muted due to the numbers involved, what the paper does suggest is there's no evidence that using a plate uh, in these cases increases the risk of non-union. Um, so it kind of gives you permission to use them uh, when you think it's necessary. And I have to say, it's not the first thing I would go to in terms of, uh, you know, I think I'm more likely to use blocking screws than, than go for a plate, but probably because I have these sorts of concerns. Um, Andy, we were talking about this before, and this is something that you've used before. Yeah, it's something that I use. But again, Sarah, um, th there are a number of um, aids for these proximal uh, tibial fractures um, commonly these days. A lot of surgeons will use an semi-extended semi position. They'll often use mm -hmm. a, a super patella entry point and super patella nailing technique. Um, again, similarly, if there's difficulty still, I, my first go to um, often would be um, looking at whether blocking wires could be used. Mm -hmm. However, I probably have a lower threshold than you for using uh, an adjunct plate. Um, so when I use the plate, I often will go actually to the anterolateral side. Um, because the soft tissue coverage over there um, is greater. And mm -hmm. if you do have wound problems, then um, it, it usually um, is going to result in any in less problematic um, long-term problems as well. However, again, as this paper says, and as previous papers have said, I believe the Bristol group have, have written about it as well, and retaining plates um, haven't shown any, any major problem. So the next paper I wanted to mention was this paper from Leeds, um, looking at time to surgery for open injuries uh, in the hand and the risk of surgical site infection. And this was published in the, the Journal of Hand Surgery European volume. And what really drew my interest to this is that this is a clinical challenge. And especially recently, I think, you know, when there's been real time on real pressure rather on theatre time, and maybe these injuries are things that have potentially waited a little bit longer over the last 10 months than we previously would have been comfortable with. So I think some evidence on this topic is very welcome. The cohort studied is taken from two tertiary hand centres and it looked at nearly a thousand patients. Inclusion criteria was patients over 16 with traumatic unilateral hand injuries distal to the risk crease. And they collected this over a two year period. They excluded any patients who presented with infection, ischemic digits, or those requiring reimplantations. The primary outcome measure um, they looked at was reoperation within 28 days of primary surgery for infection. The median time from injury to assessment was three and a half hours. And the median time from injury to surgery was 20 hours with a range of four to 90 hours. So the take home message here is that they identified 41 patients who developed an infection after primary surgery, but when comparing those that did and those that did not develop an infection, there was no difference in time to surgery between those groups. In fact, the only preoperative predictor of subsequent infection was traumatic tissue loss, not contamination, not use of antibiotics or timing thereof, and no patient factors, just uh, traumatic tissue loss. So the conclusion drawn by the authors here was that delay for primary slash definitive treatment in a tertiary hand unit is justifiable. And what I'm taking away from the paper is that a delay of one to two days to allow the case to be done by a hands colleague, which might increase the chances of A, it being the definitive procedure rather than stage, is B, the chance of getting it right first time for the patient is probably justifiable and it probably even more um, so in the, contact, uh, in the context of traumatic skin loss. Uh, so Andy, yeah, tell, tell me about the papers that you've picked out for us to, uh, to look at. Yeah, so I picked out uh, papers as well, Sarah. The first one uh, was really in looking at optimizing imaging protocols following acetabular fracture fixation. Right. And this was a study from Los Angeles in the, the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma. This study really looked at cadaveric specimens and what they were aiming to do was look at whether a lower dose CT scans post-operatively could be used for assessing fracture fixation rather than using a higher standard dose that is commonly used in practice uh, at the moment. Okay, so that was their focus was, can we use a lower dose CT rather than a higher? Yeah. Okay. So they looked at eight cadaveric specimens, so 16 hips altogether. They created posterior wall uh, acetabular fractures, 
They then fixed, they reduced and fixed them to varying degrees, one anatomically, others with varying degrees of step and gap displacement, right. and using standard posterior wall fixation techniques, screws okay. and, a, and a standard plate. A number of trauma surgeons then assessed the post-operative CTs that were done. Each specimen had a standard um, dose CT, an intermediate dose CT, and a low dose CT protocol. Right. The other thing to say about the fracture fixation was that randomly they placed intraarticular screws as well in some of the specimens. Um, I like to do that as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you threw me off a little bit there, sir. I'm going to have to look back at some of your some of your post-operative images as well. So, yeah. So having done that. The, the conclusion that they made was essentially that there was not any significant difference in assessment between the different doses of CT used and the assessment of displacement or interest articular screw um, penetration. However, when you actually look at the results of it, probably the more interesting thing was essentially how bad it was or how difficult it was to assess the fracture reduction. When you looked at it, it varied. They, they tried to categorize the reduction as either um, into um, desired and, and perfect reduction, imperfect reduction, which was a few millimeters displaced, or a poor reduction. And only between 28% and 58% of specimens were correctly identified to have that. Right. So, so pretty poor results when you're looking at that. So regardless of dose, what you, the interpretation of those CTs actually did not correlate very well with what they know that they had done to those specimens in the lab. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And, and even when you look at that in more detail, if you look at the inter-observer reliability, it was poor. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the intra-observer reliability, best, it was fair. So this probably depends on whether you ask someone on a Monday when they're feeling quite uh, upbeat about stuff, or what they think the CT scan looks like compared to a Friday morning when you're more likely to get a realistic or doer uh, appraisal of, of, of how good your reduction was. Exactly. So, <laughs> okay. you, you, you know, for yourself, Sarah, I may have to look at your specimens on a Monday. Yeah, yes. I, that's why I always show them on a Monday. And then I just go through the department until I find someone who says, yeah, that looks all right. And then we're done. OK, interesting. So what's how would you apply that to clinical practice? Because what's that saying to me is that CT scans are not the be all and end all in terms of post-operative assessment of fracture reductions. In clinical practice, it really does question, should you use a CT mm. scan post-operatively, um, regardless of the dose used? And I think for myself, the way that I would apply it is that I wouldn't routinely use a CT scan for assessment of posterior wall fractures or acetabular fractures. I think the more important thing to be thinking about is assessing it intraoperatively. And the other advantage there is that you're much more likely to be able to then change it there and then rather than having to rely on a post-operative CT scan, which you may misinterpret. Is there any patients that you would CT post-acetabular fracture? I think the most helpful ones are probably the more complex fractures. Yeah. Mainly prognostic, as I said, for the patient, as I think it's important to inform them whether there is a, you know, a reasonably good reduction, Yeah. Um, but also it can be helpful educationally in doing that. So go for it. What was your uh, second paper? Yeah, so I think you'll be very interested in this one, Sarah. You might get uh -huh. a little bit excited by this because uh -huh. it is actually a COVID-related paper. I haven't seen enough of those. Like, tell me more. Uh, well, so this paper really was the London experience from, from COVID-19 and hip fractures. And obviously, there's been lots and lots of COVID papers out sure. there. Sure. But the main reasons why I've picked this is because compared to some injuries, hip fractures are one of the injuries that during certainly the first wave of covid the management could not change. They still undergo emergency management yeah. that needs to take place. Also, as reported by one of the studies, a collaborative Scottish study that you were involved with, yeah. the rate of hip fractures during the first wave, certainly in Scotland, if anything, increased a little bit. And other studies have shown that the, the rate during the, their first waves has at least stayed the same. Mm -hmm. So this paper was a, a multi-centre cohort study during the first wave of COVID in London. It looked at 442 patients and really looked at the outcomes following hip fracture surgery for COVID positive patients compared to those that were COVID ne negative. So they had 340 COVID negative patients in the cohort and 82 COVID positive patients. And they looked at 30 day mortality and other complications associated with this. 
as well as things like critical care admission and length of hospital stay. So these are a group of neck femur fracture patients with COVID compared to neck femur fracture patients without COVID. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. What they found, not surprisingly, although it's very interesting that they reported this, increasing mortality in the COVID positive patients who undergo hip fracture surgery, and that was 30% compared to 10%. They also found increased complications, most of the complications being either cardiorespiratory, thromboembolic events, or multi-organ dysfunction. Yeah. And again, that was very high, 89% uh, versus 35%. In terms of things like critical care admission, again, as expected, it would be higher in the COVID positive patients, Mm -hmm. 61% versus 18%, um, with 10% of the COVID positive patients being admitted uh, to ITU. So, uh, yeah, so the numbers you're talking about here are a bit eye-watering in terms of, you know, is that a 90% major complication rate yeah. um, with COVID positive neck femur fracture patients yeah. and a mortality rate of 30%. Yeah, so very high. And in addition to that, they looked at length of hospital stay, which was doubled 14 days compared to seven days. They also looked at some factors which would um, account for the complications. And in particular, smoking was mm-hmm. one of the risk factors as would be expected. And um, the other thing would be Uh, multiple comorbidities so having three or more major comorbidities i think my question would be did you get any flavor either from the study yourself are these patients who are suffering from complications because of covid as an illness or are they suffering from having a neck femur fracture during the time of covid when all of our resources are so stretched yeah and it's interesting and there may be a little bit of both in there but i guess the, the first thing to say is that most likely these are related more to the disease itself okay so the reason why i say that is if you look at other papers Mm -hmm. so for example if you look at one of the more recent medical papers from the office of national statistics in england i think there's a combination between the leicester diabetes center and ucl Uh they reported that patients who haven't had surgery who have been a covid positive the readmission rate to hospital within the next six months was 30 percent and the death rate was 12%. And again, the complications associated with the readmission, the reason for readmission was really cardiorespiratory and thromboembolic events. You're right, we're entering the second wave. These things are very relevant. And actually this is, and and I mean, obviously I'm floundering now because I can't believe you read a, a non-orthopedic paper. But in fact, the, this is the sequelae of COVID, not just the environment that we're in at the moment. Exactly, and I think, my take home from this and the reason why it's interesting is not so much just the findings which some people would find to some extent unsurprising it's really the fact that with those findings it's important to inform patients with the consent process it mm. helps to inform relatives it may help to some degree with optimization of care mm-hmm. but also with the perioperative support the fact that a lot of patients are going to have these problems may need critical care support the fact that the length of stay is going to be so long afterwards as well, yeah, and that has sure. implications to the service for hip fractures, but also to the rehabilitation for the medicine for the elderly team uh, as well. Okay, so having done a sort of, uh, well, not quite a whistle-stop tour, actually, there's loads to take away from that. Um, through the rest of the journal, the paper that I've picked to talk about this month, Andy, is one from Amsterdam. It's a foot and ankle paper. The lead author is uh, Blom, and it's published in the BJJ, in fact, and the uh, title is Posterior Malleolar Ankle Fractures, Predictors of Outcome. So I'm going to try and summarise um, what is a fairly monster paper, but I think with um, some really interesting take home points. So this paper really focuses on the morphology of posterior malleolar ankle fractures. It talks about the inherent issues of reduction or malreduction with these injuries. And it uses the foot and ankle outcome scores as the primary outcome. And it talks about those in the context of fracture morphology. And so the reason I picked the paper, Andy, was not really just because of its findings, if I'm honest, but it was more broadly that it adds to our literacy of posterior malleolar ankle fractures, which is, I think, is definitely a topping of increasing interest in foot and ankle trauma. Yeah. You know, I think it really strengthens the, uh, the ongoing discourse that not all posterior malleolar ankle fractures are the same, and this trend towards appreciating the morphology and fragment-specific fixation. 
So focusing on the paper, kind of to try and sort of summarize it in a nutshell, this paper presents a retrospective review of what was prospectively collected data um, of 70 patients um, with posterior malal ankle fractures. These patients um, underwent fixation and they were actually, these 70 patients were taken from a larger study cohort, the EF3X ankle fracture trial. And what that was actually doing was collecting data to examine the use of 3D versus 2D fluoroscopy interoperatively. But the authors of that were able to then siphon these 70 off because these 70 patients had posterior malfractures. So that's from a larger cohort of about 180 patients. Uh, all of these patients were treated in uh, the same level one trauma center. The mean age of the patients was 47. There was about a 50 50 uh, male to female ratio, and the, uh, it was mainly low energy mechanisms of injury. So these ankle fractures were managed operatively, either with a type of direct fixation of the posterior mal, such as an anti glide plate, and that might be to one fragment, or in the case of the posterior mal fractures that have a separate posterior lateral and posterior medial fracture, maybe two separate antiglides, uh, an AP screw or even a PA screw. So they were all direct fixations of these posterior mal fractures. Or they were treated with an indirect fixation, and that's basically a syndesmosis screw and either a single or a double. Interestingly, the authors don't present any sub-analysis that was done by type of fixation. They've stayed true to their, their word and they've really focused on the fracture morphology rather than try to start compare one type of fixation versus another. The morphology was classified using the Haraguchi classification one to three. And I'm going to come on to this later in the discussion. And the fracture reduction was assessed postoperatively using a CT scan. So all of these patients got CT scans post-op. Um, and the measurements they made when examining fracture reduction were either defined as a classic type of measurement, such as residual fracture gap postoperatively, or an articular step, which is, I think is something that you know we're used to looking at in terms of um, ankle fracture reduction as, as a quantifier of, of reduction. Or they defined these new contemporary measurements, which included the total surface area of any step off of the articular surface, the 3D rotational displacement of these fracture fragments, a step in the fibular notch, or quality of syndesmotic reduction, which they made binary. It was either reduced well or not reduced. So is that making sense so far in terms of what the study looked like? Yeah, no, it makes, makes clear sense there, Sarah. Um, so what were the good things about this study? First of all, findings were based on post-operative CT scans. So that I think immediately is, is very helpful. And this allowed for real rigor and detailed analysis, which honestly is almost a little bit mind boggling when you first read the paper, but the authors definitely have to be commended on what was a very thorough analysis of these, of these ankle fractures. They had a two year follow up for these patients. So this is really, I think, a yeah, very good length of follow up and does tell you something about how these fractures behave. And the fourth one that I'm going to say is a good thing is this heterogeneity of uh, fixation mode. I can see how that could look like an inconsistency because you might read it and say, well, I would never do that for that type of fracture. But I think if you're looking at the effect of morphology on outcome, I think by allowing, you know, surgeon choice in terms of how to fix things, you remove that as a type of bias, as a bias, because you're not saying, oh, actually the results of this type of fixation are this, you really are saying the results of this fracture morphology are this. In terms of limitations, I think just a couple of things that you probably have to mention that it's not tiny, but 70 patients isn't huge um, and it's not statistically powered and it's a single center. So again, we can't be sure it's reproducible, but again, I stress that this is a, a paper that's looking at the effect of morphology rather than their intervention. Yes, yeah, so I've tried to highlight a few points for discussion here. And the first one, I'll loop back to this, is that I think this paper, by its very existence, calls for us to get on board and embrace this greater understanding of posterior mal fractures. So I don't know about you, but I spent my, my entire training and my practice, you know, in ankle trauma so far, sort of really extolling the virtues of Larg Hansen. You know, I think it gives you a good working understanding of ankle fractures and fixation methods. But I'm probably now having to just accept that it isn't, it can't do everything and it isn't everything. And I think this paper adds to that literacy. And I think it goes well with the work from Liverpool that we're seeing in terms of promoting interest and, and increasing knowledge in posterior mal ankle fractures. So the second point I'd make is that 
the results rely on an understanding of Haraguchi's uh, classification. And I, I just want to highlight that to the listener because it's different to the Mason classification. So, you know, in the UK, we've spoken about this a lot over the last 12 months. And finally, just before um, moving on to the take-home messages from the paper, to again reassure us that we really can banish fixation method as a bias to the results, the authors found, and I thought this was really interesting actually, that there were no significant differences in the quality of reduction between fixation methods, you know, be that an anti-glide plate, an AP screw or a PA screw, they found that the reduction was equally good across the board. So now what can we take from the findings? So the first one is that in the postural shear fractures of the posterior malleolus, there were two predictors of poor outcome, and that was residual intraarticular step-off and poor quality of syndesmotic reduction. They were both independently associated with a poor reduction in those patients, which again kind of makes sense because we think with those big shear fractures, we need to restore articular congruency. The second one is that in these posterior malleolar fractures with postural and postural medial fragments, these fractures did worse across the board on the foot and ankle outcome scores compared to postural lateral only or the rim type that we're going to come on to. So there's definitely something about the, this pattern that involves the postural medial um, section of the tibia that confers a poorer outcome. And in these fractures, actually only step off, step off sorry, the fibula notch, predictive of poor outcome, which I thought was really interesting because you're saying that there's something about the postural medial um, involvement that makes it poor. But actually what they found was it was the step off at the notch in these fractures, in the fibula notch that caused the court was that was associated with bad outcomes. So I suppose you're saying that maybe they're more inherently difficult to reduce is my wonder in these in these fractures. So the final, the third um, type that they talked about was this rim type avulsion fractures of the um, PITFL. And in these fractures, quality of syndesmotic reduction was a predictor of foot and ankle outcome scores, which isn't really surprising given that these are very small fragments. You're not likely going to see uh, an associated significant fracture gap or 3D displacement, and they are often going to be managed with an indirect fixation method like a syndesmosis screw. So it's really quality of, of your syndesmotic reduction in these fractures that's the, the most important. So to summarise the take home messages from this paper, for me, one, embrace the fragment specific discussion of posterior mal fractures. They're just they're not all the same. And I've just got to get over that. In postural actual shear fractures, you must aim to anatomically reduce the articular surface and the syndesmosis. It's key. In fractures involving the postural medial fragments, counsel patients of the associated poorer prognosis and focus on restoring the fibular notch congruency. And in the third type, the rim avulsion fractures, quality of syndesmotic reduction is key intraoperatively. So Sarah, that's a really interesting uh, paper. I guess the, the question that I'd like to ask is really simple. If you look at the Bolster Ankle Fracture Guideline from 2016, it recommends CT scanning for more complex ankle injuries. With regards to this paper and other papers that have come out more recently looking more at posterior malleolar morphology, would it now be recommended to see CT scan all ankle fractures that have a posterior malle malleolar configuration to it? Yeah, Andy, do you know that's a really key thing to come out of the discussion of this paper because it was one of their key conclusions was all posterior mal fractures should be CT scanned. It's also a conclusion that Lyndon Mason came to in his Hunterian lecture last year. And in fact, he's kind of answered the question for us because he looked at uh, the papers around imaging and posterior malleolar fractures and found that the sensitivity of plain radiographs alone was only about 20%. And that in all of the studies, CT scan changed the operative management of these fractures. And it's particularly the posterior um, medial, the postural medial fragments that are not well visualized on plain x-rays. So essentially the message is, yes, if there's posterior mal fracture, a CT scan pre-op. Okay, so over to you, Andy. And I think the paper that you've picked um, this for discussion is again on the trauma theme, but different, we're moving more centrally from foot and ankle on to hips. So tell us about this big paper actually on hip fractures. Yeah, this is another massive treat because this is the second paper that was published in the Lancet that is featured in the BJJ 360. <laughs> uh, this is a thing that some people only dream of really. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so this was a hip attack study and hip attack, I believe standard, uh, stood for hip fracture accelerated treatment track study. 
And it, it was based in Canada and funded in Canada, but it was an international multi-center randomized control trial. It involved 69 hospitals in 17 countries. And it looked at an accelerated surgery pathway for hip fractures patients versus standard care. Right. And what they aimed to do was assess whether this accelerated pathway could really reduce mortality for these patients, as well as major complications. It was based on previous observational studies preceded by a pilot study. There was power analysis in order to calculate sample size enrollment, extremely well-designed uh, trial. It also had rigorous checking regimes, uh, monitoring data centrally for consistency, looking at statistical monitoring and also at hospital site monitoring as well. The outcome assessors were also masked to the treatment group. Right. Patients included in the study uh, were representative for the typical neck of femur fracture population. There were low energy hip fractures that were included. The age was over 45, but the mean age for patients was 79 years, which would be typical again for this group. 33% uh, of patients had assistance of activities of daily living. 20% mm -hmm. were nursing home residents. 20% had dementia. And the fracture type, again, would be typical of what you would see at your average trauma meeting with a approximately a 50-50 split of intracapsular neck of femurs and extracapsular neck of femurs. The exclusion criteria, again, were very appropriate. They excluded periprosthetic fractures, bilateral hip fractures, open fractures, and emergency surgery that was carried out for other reasons, such as a, a subdural uh, hematoma. Okay. So before going on to, to talk about the results, I think it's important just to talk about this, the, the different pathways. The accelerated surgery group the aim here was really to facilitate surgery for the hip fracture patients as quickly as possible. And based on their previous um, observational studies and pilot study, it was aimed to try and have the surgical operations performed uh, by six hours. Now, what that meant and what they put into place for this study was that patients randomized to this group had medical assessment and clearance for surgery by physicians who were readily available to rapidly review these patients. The patients that were operated on were also prioritized for theater on the next available trauma slot. And that meant that elective patients or non-emergent trauma patients were therefore postponed in favor of these patients. In addition to this, to avoid cancellation for the patients, um, in particular the elective patients, in place was an extra operating slot at the end of the day to accommodate for these patients to prevent cancellation. Okay, so practically this is a huge undertaking. These patients are hitting the hospital and they're being medically worked up and getting to theatre within six hours. They're treated like an orthopaedic emergency and other patients are being displaced onto lists later or additional lists in order to make way for that. Exactly, right. exactly. And when you look at the standard care group, it would be similar for standard care in most hospitals. Okay. The big difference really being that the medical assessment and clearance for theatre occurred according to your local standard practice. So there was no rapid assessment medically for these patients to optimise them for theatre. Okay. So when looking at the results from this study, the 2,970 patients were enrolled into the study mm -hmm. and following random allocation, 1,487 patients were randomised to the accelerated care pathway 1,483 patients uh, randomised to the standard care pathway. Only, well, only seven patients in the, random, in the accelerated care pathway were lost to follow-up, eight patients in the standard pathway, so the loss to follow-up was less than 1%. Very, very impressive. Yeah, very, yeah. Looking at the baseline characteristics between the groups, which were extensively analysed, there was no significant difference. Okay. The big difference was really, as expected, median time to uh, surgery for the hip fracture patients. In the accelerated group, this was a median time of six hours. And in the standard care group, this was a median time of 24 hours. And this was statistically significant with an absolute difference of 18 hours. Yes, yeah, so they really did achieve what they set out to do. They really did provide an accelerated service for that group of patients. Yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. Looking at the outcomes, there was no difference statistically in terms of mortality between the two groups. So the mortality was 9% in the accelerated group versus 10% in the standard care group. Right. Similarly, major complications did not show any significant difference between the two pathways with 22% in both groups. Mm -hmm. However, other complications such as delirium, 
infection without sepsis, urinary tract infection was, was less in the accelerated uh, group. So similarly, time to mobilization following randomization uh, was less in the accelerated group with 24 hours compared to 46 hours in the standardized care group. Right. And also mean time to discharge was less in the accelerated group as well, 10 days versus 11 days. Other outcomes that they looked at were orthopedically related outcomes. And again, there was no difference between the two groups. So specifically, they looked at reoperation rate, dislocation, implant failure, periprosthetic fractures and surgical site infection. And there was no difference between the two right, groups okay. as well. So in terms of, you mentioned there that one of the statistical differences was the uh, time to discharge, but the actual difference in that was a day. Is that right? Yeah, one day. And when you look at that, I mean, as I said, this was a very robust study mm. and the statistics were very robust as well. The only thing that um, I was interested when I looked at that was they, they looked at mean time to discharge. And as we know, in a frail elderly population, yeah. often there will be variability in discharge. And often in some patients, it can be prolonged for a number of different reasons. Yeah. And when you, it's just interesting looking at mean, because when you look at mean, you do wonder whether a delayed discharge that's prolonged for a long time yeah. could skew the results, particularly for the mean. And I would be interested to look at the median as well to find out if that was also statistically significant. Yeah, that yes, that does make sense. Yeah, so again, that kind of goes hand in hand because if you're getting your surgery earlier, six hours versus 24 hours, you're gonna go home earlier. So it's a kind of that, it, 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 it's proportional. Does that make sense? You're literally shifting the events in that patient's care a day further forward and that includes surgery and then discharge. Yeah, exactly. And I guess that's okay. what they're trying to aim with that accelerated care uh, yeah. pathway. So, you know, overall, you have to commend the authors that have designed this study. It is extremely well designed. It's obviously an international multi-center randomized control trial that's, as I've mentioned, has been rigorously uh, done with a low loss to follow up. It's also should be commended that they've looked at changes to patients' pathways and service provision rather than just looking at a single treatment modality as well. Yep. The authors do outline the limitations to their study, but the comments that I would really like to make is thinking about the feasibility mm -hmm. of implementing that to your own hospital and trying to accommodate an accelerated pathway for these patients, particularly yeah. when some of the main outcomes really aren't showing a significant difference between standard care anyway. Mm -hmm. In particular, if you're looking at this accelerated care pathway, it did require a lot of flexibility of your theatre time, particularly looking at uh, prioritizing these patients over either elective patients or other trauma patients mm -hmm. and this was highlighted in the study when you looked look overall at the the results there was just under 8,000 patients eligible for the trial but 25 percent of them were not enrolled and the reason they were not enrolled was because they could not accommodate them in the operating theater or there was no surgeon available to do the do the case right okay so actually, there's a large number of patients that they didn't enroll because actually that huge feasibility that we talked about and flexibility wasn't available that day. Exactly. Exactly. Right, okay. And also, you know, in, in practice, is for everyone, when you're trying to change theatre lists, mm -hmm. even if you can accommodate for that, the efficiency of that list also has often goes down when you're trying to do that and change cases, you know, from, from what was planned initially. Yeah, this is something that, you know, I think comes up a lot and I've, you know, we've talked about before, the two competing factors in any theatre list, efficiency and flexibility. And you, you, there are opposite ends. Uh, I don't think you can please both. And so as you say, my, my role would be that this flexibility actually leads to potentially fewer cases being done. And those other cases might not be neck of femur fractures, but they were the waiting trauma cases. Yeah, definitely. And that's something that you, you see quite common when you change the list. Mm -hmm. The other things um, uh, to think about is that um, not all patients in the neck of femur population will be able to be optimized anyway. Yeah. Um, by definition, these patients have significant comorbidities. And even when you're trying to optimize them, some of them will still need to have treatment that then will lead to delayed surgery anyway. Mm -hmm. And again, that was highlighted in the paper. There was at least uh, 200 to 250 patients which were not enrolled in the study because they were classified as physician declined. Now I'm presuming that means that those patients were not optimized, not that the physician declined to actually go and see them, <laughs> right. but you can take what you will from that, that <laughs> statement. Okay.
I guess the, the other thing to say about this was that the study was really uh, taking place in normal standard working hours. Right. So they did not look at patients out of hours. And obviously a proportion of neck and femur fracture patients will obviously present in the evening time or overnight. And so the implications of trying to provide an accelerated care pathway is obviously um, going to be more difficult in the out of hours, which wasn't looked at in this study. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So yeah, that does make a big difference actually to the applicability to trying to, you know, as you say, trying to apply this to our practice here, because these are all patients recruited from in hours. These are not your neck and femur fractures that kind of coming in at 10, 10 a.m. and therefore would have to wait a minimum of 10 hours to go to theatre anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So overall, the take home message from this paper really was that an accelerated care pathway uh, for neck and femur fractures trying to provide surgery within uh, a six hour period did not significantly change mortality or major complications for these patients. However, the paper did show improvement in delirium, urinary tract infections, and also uh, allowed earlier weight bearing and earlier mobilization, and may also reduce length of stay looking at the paper. And the authors in that paper are going on to look at an economic analysis to try and see whether length of stay and the cost effectiveness of this um, may be helpful and therefore give, give further weight to the accelerated care pathway. Yeah, a, a really ambitious paper, as you say, very rigorous and uh, grateful for your efforts in going through that and picking out the, the, key, the key messages there. So thank you, Andy. No worries. That brings us to the end of this episode and a big thank you from the team at 360 to Andy Marsh for being such a great guest. I'm really looking forward to February's podcast because listeners from December will remember that the team is growing and Tim Coughlin, Upland Specialist, will be hosting from Queen's Medical Centre. You can subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, Google and Apple and follow us on Twitter at Bonejoint360 for more updates.